Uh, good morning and a very warm welcome to you and to those who are listening online to our worship service this morning. We are continuing our series of sermons on the book of Joshua and this morning uh, the theme is Stones of Remembrance. We want to ask that the Lord will indeed bless our time together, wherever you are, whether at home or in elsewhere. If you're listening to this service, I trust that the Lord will indeed bless you and that he will bless all of us as we worship him uh, together. The psalmist said, Come, bless the Lord with me, for the Lord is like a father to his children compassionate, merciful, filled with endless love. He forgives our sins and heals the sickness inside us. He surrounds us with love and mercy and fills our lives with good things. And so with that um, at the back of our minds and with those wonderful words, let us uh, worship God together as we sing our opening hymn, 166, Lord of All Hopefulness. Bible tells us to approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you this morning for your promises. We thank you for the promise to be with us and among us today, wherever we are, as we worship you in a spirit of humility and indeed true holiness and purity of heart. We invite you to be our true mirror, to hold up before us your word in such a way that we may see our true selves for who we really are 
Help us, Lord, also to see in a new way the fullness of your glory, your transcendent grace, and your abiding mercy. Father, we await in the next hour your word to us, that by it we may be empowered to live in the world, announcing your justice, your reconciliation, and your peace. Lord, lead us home when we wander lost in the wilderness of our own making. Like errant children, we often stray from the safety of our heavenly parent, yourself. We hear your voice calling, but all too often we go our own way. We remember your teachings, but instead we follow the foolish desires and whims of our foolish hearts. O oh, Father, you see us in our sin, and yet, by your divine grace, you love us still. We are so very grateful to you, Lord. And even when we continue on and on, over and over again, with the same feelings, your grace never runs out. And so we praise you for your faithfulness, Father, this morning. We confess our inability to flee temptation apart from you. So keep our eyes set ever on you. Continue to remind us of what is true and convict us of the sins which we sometimes harbour for far too long. Turn our hearts back to you, Lord. We receive with gratefulness your forgiveness and we believe that we are righteous in your sight through the love, the sacrifice, the death, and the forgiveness which Jesus offers to us. And so, Lord, be with us now. Be with your people, wherever they are, whoever they are. Lord, be with them now. And may your blessing, your divine, beautiful blessing, rest upon them and upon all of us as we worship you in spirit and in truth. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, <clears throat> forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is Joshua chapter 4. Our Bible reading this morning can be found in the book of Joshua, chapter 4, verses 1 to the end. It's entitled, Memorial Stones Are Set Up. When the whole nation had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men, one from each tribe, and command them to take twelve stones out of the middle of the Jordan, from the very place where the priests were standing. Tell them to carry these stones with them and to put them down where they, your camp tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men he had chosen and said, Go into the Jordan ahead of the covenant box of the Lord your God. Each one of you take a stone on your shoulder, one for each of the tribes of Israel. These stones will remind the people of what the Lord has done. In the future, when your children ask what these stones mean to you, it will tell them that the water of the Jordan stopped flowing when the Lord's covenant box crossed the river. These stones will always remind the people of Israel of what happened here. The men followed Joshua's orders as the Lord had commanded Joshua. They took twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, one for each of the tribes of Israel, carried them to the camping place and put them down there. 
Joshua also set up twelve stones in the middle of Jordan, where the priests carrying the covenant box had stood. These stones are still there. The priests stood in the middle of the Jordan until everything had been done that the Lord ordered Joshua to tell the people to do. This is what Moses had commanded. The people hurried across the river when they were all on the other side. The priests with the Lord's covenant box went on ahead of the people. The men of the tribes of Reuben and Gad and of half the tribe of Manasseh, ready for battle, crossed ahead of the rest of the people, as Moses had told them to do. In the presence of the Lord, about 40,000 men, ready for war, crossed over to the plain near Jericho. What the Lord did that day made the people of Israel consider Joshua a great man. They honoured him all his life, just as they had honoured Moses. Then the Lord told Joshua to command the priests carrying the covenant box to come up out of the Jordan. Joshua did so, and when the priests reached the river bank, the river began flowing once more and flooded its banks again. The people crossed the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and made camp in Gilgal, east of Jericho. There Joshua set up the twelve stones taken from the Jordan. He said to the people of Israel, In the future, when your children ask you what these stones mean, you will tell them about the time when Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Tell them that the Lord your God dried up the water of the Jordan for you until you had crossed, just as he dried up the Red Sea for us. Because of this, everyone on earth will know how great the Lord's power is, and you will honour the Lord your God forever. Amen. And the Lord will add a blessing to this reading of his own precious word. Amen. Our next hymn is from Mission Praise, is 469, My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
Let us pray. Gracious God, your word is more precious than fine gold and sweeter than purest honey. As we turn to your word, send your Holy Spirit to infuse your word with truth and grace so that the good news of your love will shine before our eyes and delight our senses and so that we cannot help but respond in wonder, faith and trust. Bless this your word and ask your people for Christ's sake. Amen. Can I please ask you to turn to your Bibles, to the book of Joshua, chapter 4. And I want to address, uh, before we go any further, the verses 21 and 22. There we read, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. It was the American comedian Steve Martin <clears throat> who once suggested a rather humorous experiment for those who are 50 and over. First of all, he said, place your set of keys on your right hand. Second, with your left hand, phone a friend and have a little chat with them and then invite them round for a meal. Thirdly, hang up the phone. And fourthly, he went on to say, now think, where are your keys? Now we may smile, or perhaps maybe not, but if you are about my age, which I am sure some of you are, then something I am sure this has happened to you. I'm sure it has. We may wish to ignore it or not, uh, not accept that fact, but I'm sure it has. You are looking for your keys and suddenly your wife points out they are actually in your hand. Or perhaps you have had this experience. Uh, you go into a room in the house and you, you know you have gone in there for something that clearly you are looking for, for a purpose. But you stand there for a good 15 minutes trying to remember what on earth you are there for. Of course, it certainly is a little bit of a humorous uh, story, but you and I know that forgetfulness can have a far more serious consequences than being an agonizing reminder that we are just growing old. In fact, we all know friends and family members that for them the loss of memory is a sad and tragic reality. For it cuts them off from days gone by. It strips away the precious memories of past experiences. It erases their personal history and it leaves them, it leaves them with and unaccountable blank pages, as if they never existed. Certainly it is sad, and I have visited so many of them in my ministry as a minister, it is very sad and difficult and at times embarrassing not to remember. And yet while for some people the lapses and the failure of memory is largely unavoidable and tragic. It is a disease for many of them. That is not always the case for many other people. For sometimes, often even, we are forgetful, not because of our inability or the lack of faculties to remember mentally, most people are fine, but it is simply because of neglect and a deliberate failure in choosing, please underline that word, choosing, make a conscious decision to remember the past. We don't want to remember, apparently for some people, 
We become careless. We become thoughtless to those who have preceded us. We center all our attention only on our own time, our own place. We act as though inconsequential and an important thing about those things that clearly has been part of our lives. We want to cast them away. We want to leave them behind like a worn out pair of shoes, which is not good anymore other than the bin. Something to get rid of and silence for good. It's very much like many today with the cancel culture who want to get rid of parts of our history simply because they don't like it or just because they don't agree with it. But this is not just a tragic failure of neglect, but also it's a deliberate denial of the past, which has serious, serious consequences, as well as this is totally irrational and utterly foolish. Just think, the reasons why many nations and countries have established acts of remembrance, including our very own, is so that we can offset and balance this tendency we all have towards forgetfulness and ingratitude. For instance, we celebrate birthdays, expressing our thanks for the gift of life. We have wedding anniversaries, so that we don't take this sacred institution for granted. Don't forget, it was God who instituted marriage. And of course, there is Remembrance Sunday or Armistice Day, so that future generations will not forget that many of the freedoms they enjoy today were purchased at a great personal cost. But now, tragically, we see all around us just what happens when a society, a nation, fails to count its blessings and exercises corporate forgetfulness and neglect. And my friends, this is a deliberate act. What were once considered privileges are now thought of as rights, with the result that gratitude gives way to greed, to self-indulgence, to arrogance and pride. It was Dostoevsky who, writing about man in his notes from the underground, he said, and I quote, If he is not stupid, he is monstrously ungrateful, phenomenally ungrateful. In fact, I believe that the best definition of man is the ungrateful human being. End of quote. And sadly, how true that is, isn't it? But what about us? What about us, people of faith? What about you? What about me, who call ourselves Christians? You see, this, from a spiritual and Christian point of view, should be a warning to all of us. And the reason why it is very clear, because forgetfulness erodes the foundation of our relationship with God. It will undermine, it will neglect his role in our lives. And in the end, after we have gone through that process, guess what will happen? It will lead to a failure of faith. Yes, you hear me well. It will lead to a failure of faith. It would lead to apostasy. It would lead to backsliding. It would leave leaving the faith that we once we cherished. But now we have just probably been it or just let it drift by the wayside. And this tragically becomes all the more acute when a nation, a nation forgets God. I cannot even begin to imagine how sad 
our country, the United Kingdom, has become. In the past, we were known as a Christian country, a country where we sent hundreds of missionaries into other parts of the world to tell them about the fundamental basis and teachings of God as found in the Bible through Christ our Savior. That was the past, but not today. Today it is not like that. Scotland is one of the most liberal countries in the world. We have become secular. We, got, we have become atheistic. Of course, this is nothing new. It was Abraham Lincoln, the American president, who warned his fellow countrymen back in 1863 when he said, we have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But, and he went on to say, we have forgotten God. He saw the civil war as God's act of judgment upon them for doing so. And along the same lines, in more recent times, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian novelist, philosopher and historian, declared this to be the root problem of the modern world, which has given rise to the gulags and the death camps. He said this, if we are called upon to identify the principle of the entire 20th century, it is this, men have forgotten God. And so it comes as no surprise that the theme and the subject of remembering with this twin truth of gratitude has tremendous emphasis in the Bible. And so this morning, the Old Testament text of Joshua, chapter 4, verses 1 to 9 at least, stands as one example of this practice. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the people of God had at long last, at long last, entered the promised land. Just as it took a miracle to get them out of Egypt, it took a miracle to get them into Canaan. Just as God parted the Red Sea for Moses, he parted the Jordan River for Joshua. And both, please note, both of those miracles happened so that each generation would know and will remember that the Lord was with them in their time of need. And that he is the same God who performed both miracles. But of course, Joshua knew that even mighty miracles as they are could be forgotten very easily, very easily, unless we do something to remember them. And so he instructed 12 men, one from each tribe, to take a large stone from the middle of the river bank or the riverbed where the priests were standing with the Ark of the Covenant. You remember, we talked about it a little bit last Sunday. The Ark of the Covenant reminded them it represented the very presence of God. Each man was to take one large stone, a real hernia maker. Put it on his shoulders and carry it to the place where the Israelites would camp that night, a place called Gilgal. And I will mention something later on about that. And as soon as the men had carried the stones from the Jordan River, the priest, we are told, followed them. Then the moment the priest stepped into the west bank, the water started flowing again. And when the men got to Gilgal, Joshua had them build a monument, a memorial from those simple 12 stones to commemorate the amazing event. And that is why you will always see Jewish people placing stones at burial grounds, tombs, 
and memorials. Over the last few weeks, I have been watching, or certainly the last week in particular, lots of programs to mark the Holocaust. And it's amazing how many of these concentration camps and many places where atrocities, barbaric deaths took place to trying to exterminate the Jewish people. What you have now are just simple memorials of stones as their focal point. Stones, all based from these kinds of incidents found in Scripture, to remind them, to remind them of the significance of remembering. And why all this hassle and trouble for the people of Israel? Because these have to remind them that their progress, indeed their very existence, was all in the hands of the living God. The Passover feast which Moses instituted was to serve a similar purpose, to remind the people that it was God, not they themselves, who brought about their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. So what is the meaning for us today as Christians? And so this morning I want you to notice as a reply to that question, the significance, the meaning, the reasons given for these 12 memorial stones and, and the call to remember. And the first thing I want you to notice and to take note of this very important, please do so, is to be a, a, a time of remembering what God has done. First of all, these 12 memorial stones were to call to remember as a time of remembrance of what God has done, not us, Him. First, the memorial stones were to be a reminder of their own personal experience. Notice that in verse 6, this memorial will cause their children to ask, and I quote, what do these stones mean to you? Verse 6, what do these stones mean to you? Now that's a very important and very significant little verse, don't you think? Because these are the children asking the question. They want to know, what do they mean to you, mom, dad, whoever you are? In other words, these stones are, first of all, a reminder to those who were present of their personal experience, what they saw, what they heard, what they felt. Tell your story. Keep a clear memory of what God did for you. Keep on telling your story so that you never lose your own sense of awe and wonder of what God has done in your life. I want you to consider with me this morning, what kind of memorials do you have in your life? You as an individual, after all, whether you realize it or not, we all have memorials in our life, not necessarily physical stones, but certainly memorials built on memories. They are the memories of places, places that trigger memories, just as the memorial stones in Gilgal. There are some significant places in your life that may elicit some memories to you. For instance, to me, the little church back in Murcia in Spain, where I was saved, where I first heard the gospel, it was there I came to faith as a 19-year-old boy. It is a special place for me. Probably it doesn't exist anymore, that little church. But in my mind, it certainly is engraved there. It reminds me of the journey of faith when God became real to me. And I began a journey of experience and things which God has done in my life, even to this very day. And likewise, no doubt, you too 
have also such places or places in your life. And my friend, you need to remember those places. You need to remember what led you there, why you were there, and who led you there. God is there. And you must remember, there are memories of, place, of people. These are pe memories of people who God has used in your life. For me, many of them are the people who encouraged me to pursue the ministry. And those who influence my understanding of God and His Word. Not all theologians, but even all ladies. Even insignificant people who are doing very little in terms of the world. And yet, deep down, they have a profound sense and knowledge and awareness of God. That whatever they say makes such a huge difference. I remember faces. I remember these people. And I hold them dear in my heart. Because they were instrumental people who led me to understand God better. Who led me to love them more. And you too have people like that. I'm sure you do. And if you can't remember a thing, pray that God will bring you to mind. How often do we sit down and think about the memories and thank God for those people he has used in our lives? When was the last time you ever did that? But then we have memories of experiences. Of God's answering prayer and of God's marvelous hand of provision. I remember when on many occasions, not just once, but many occasions when I and Marie, we were just married and we had not very much money. In fact, I could not work because I didn't have a visa. I was not allowed to work and Marie had a very humble work. So money was very scarce. But I remember how many times how God wonderfully provided for our needs. No one knew our desperate situation, but God did. He did, and he provided. And we learned some invaluable lessons on faith and trust. These lessons on faith are not something you can just be taught. It is something you have to experience to truly understand. But when you go through it, that's what really makes an impact in your mind, in your heart. You want to remember them. We ought to remember them. And then there are also the momentous of the past. If you were to come to the manse, into my study and look around you, you would see miscellaneous objects. That are reminders to me of life experiences and items of great significance. Each of them, each of them trigger memories of what happened then. And of the things that God did at a given time. Things that I experience that have changed my life. Little objects, some not expensive at all. And yet full of memories. Some precious, others filled with mixed emotions. That reminds me of bad times, but all of them help me to remember my past and what God did through them. And my friends, the point of all of this is that God knows how we think. And that is the reason he instructs Joshua to build a memorial so that each time the Israelites saw it, they would be reminded that they had not crossed the Jordan on their own ability, on their own strength. No. It was all of God. And so let me encourage you, my friend, and I am sure that this morning God is speaking to you because he's speaking to me. He's speaking to all of us. And I want to encourage you if that is the case and even if it isn't the case that you think, well, no, that's, that doesn't apply to me. Well, you'll be a very brave person to say that. But nevertheless, if you're thinking about it, 
Why don't you spend some time thinking through your memorial stones in your mind, in your life? Let them draw you closer to God to remind you, remind you of his faithfulness. Of his goodness. Of the things that God has done when you never even thought about him. And yet, if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't be here today. I want you to remember and I want you to be grateful to him. I say this because amongst the Israelites, those who forgot the past fell into ingratitude disloyalty and thoughtlessness. It was Martin Luther who used to place great stress on the Latin proverb, nothing ages more quickly than gratitude. And sadly, that is often the case, isn't it? If we forget the value of our heritage and the source of our blessing, it will become very easy, very easy, far too easy for us to take it for granted all that we have and all that we are. It will be very easy for us to begin believing that we can make it all on our own self-esteem. How foolish, how foolish we are if we think that way. And so my friends, it's so very important that we remember. But there is another reason a very significant reason for the memorial stones because they were meant to be a means of instruction and teaching, especially to serve as the basis of sharing faith with their children. In this chapter, my friends, if you are a parent, take note, listen carefully here. Parents are reminded of the responsibility for their communication of God's word and his calling on their children. Whether they believe or not, it is your duty to remind them, to tell them. It is all of God and whether they accept your words or not, it is your duty to tell them, to declare to them, we are who we are and we are where we are because God Almighty has brought us this far. There is a lesson here for all of us. Read verses 21 to 23. When your children ask their fathers in times to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel cross over this Jordan on dry land, for the Lord your God dry up. The Lord your God dry up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dry up before us until we had crossed over. There is a lesson here for all of us. We have a sacred responsibility to take the truth of God and see that it is passed on to the next generation. Does not the psalmist in Psalm 102 verse 18 says, Let this be written for a future generation that the people not yet created Future generations may praise the Lord, may acknowledge Him, may revere Him, may worship Him, may believe in Him, follow Him, and allow His influence to dictate their lives and bring that life to a sacred relationship that will give them, in the end, eternal life. And that means to all of us that those who are older have a special obligation to pass on the stories of what God did for them. You, my dear people, you who feel, well, I am too old now. I'm 70, 80, 90, 100. I, what can I do? My friend, you can do much. Make sure you pass on that message. Make sure that your precious Jesus, your precious God that you love and you cherish and you care for, 
is being understood and declared to younger generations, to your children, your grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren, your neighbors, anyone. Parents bear the first responsibility of teaching their children, but not just parents in general, but fathers in particular. Dads, fathers, be aware that God holds you accountable. And I'm a father myself. For the spiritual development of your children, your sons and daughters look to you for answers. They will ask you, what do these stones mean, Dad? Tell me about your faith. Tell me about this God that you believe in. What will you say to them? How are you going to explain to them who he is? Well, you are to tell them what a great God we worship. A God who is unlimited in power, who managed to get a whole nation across a river. As if we are on dry land, a God who is faithful to his promise day by day. That is what we should tell them. My friends, let me make it very clear. The Christian faith, the Christian movement is always only one generation from extension in any given nation. And every church and congregation is only one generation away from closing their doors. Even this church here in Blegari. Unless you declare the message of God, unless you and I take a, a responsibility and tell everyone and communicate your faith, this church will not be here probably in another 10, 15, 20 years' time. What an obligation we all have. You see, Joshua wasn't concerned about his generation anymore for him. That was the past. He has seen it. He has experienced. Joshua had not forgotten what God did 40 years in the wilderness. But now Joshua was looking to the future as you and I ought to. You know, my friends, we might not be here next year because we don't know where we might be. But we will be one. We will be somewhere in a hundred years time. And that is a place in eternity. I wonder what are you going to tell God what you did or failed to do to prepare a generation about the significance of the spiritual lives and what God wants to do in them. You cannot, we cannot ignore that. We are here today to do much the same thing that Joshua and his people did 3,500 years ago memorial stones but let me very quickly and I know that I have spent quite a bit of time this morning I know that but since we are on lockdown I can take the liberty of preach a bit longer and so I do but the final thing I want to mention is to be a time of rolling away and removing precious downfalls and setbacks that is the third thing now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. Now it is significant that this happened on the 10th day, 10th day of the first month. That is exactly 40 years to the day since Israel marched out of Egypt. And so leaving the edge of the river, the Israelites went to a place called Gilgal. Verse 19 to make their camp. Now this is what we need to understand. Gilgal means the reproach has been rolled away. In other words, the disgrace, the shame had been removed. 40 years of spiritual defeat and failure have been rolled away. It was the dawn of a great new beginning in a new land, the day of sullen and hostile refusal to respond to God and the Moses were gone. Complaining was ended. Hopeless wandering in the wilderness was behind them. They were now a people with powerful new sense of purpose, determined to take new territory with God. And likewise, for the Christian today, we should be able to look back 
and see those monumental locations which stands out as times in which God has changed our directions and give us new hope in a new sense of purpose. And my friends, you may say to me, well, what are these occasions? What are these things? My friend, let me give you just one. I have mentioned about people and places and experiences. That should be enough. But if you want something a bit more spiritual, what about Good Friday? Can I remind you of Good Friday? Because that was the day the true Passover lamb was sacrificed. That is when Jesus died, remember? He is our true lamb, Passover lamb, who was sacrificed for our sins. It was on that day that Jesus cried out in victory, it is finished. It is done. It is accomplished. The transaction has been completed. My people's sins have been atoned for. The reproach has been rolled away. The disgrace, the shame has been removed. It was not Jesus who said to that repentant thief, you will be with me in paradise today, not tomorrow or next week, but today, no ifs, no buts or maybes. It is guaranteed, it is certain, it is paid for, it is delivered. That is Good Friday. That is what happened on this significant day. Are you going to tell me that that day doesn't mean a thing to you? Then what about Christmas? Does that mean anything to you? What about Easter Sunday? Does that mean anything to you? What about the day when Jesus was ascended into glory and he promised that the Holy Spirit will come upon the church, which happened on the day of Pentecost? Did that, does that mean anything to you? Memorials to remind us of our faith, of our salvation, of the God who has done it all. We cannot take any credit for these things. We are debtors to God, my friends. You are a debtor to him. I am a debtor to him. Memorial monuments have been built with stones of remembrance, a visible reminder of the faithfulness of God and an eloquent statement of the grace and the power of our Savior. And so, in conclusion, let me say, when the prophets of all called upon God's people and told them to remember the works that the Lord has done in the past, this was to prepare them for the future. They were not called to remember the past for his own sake, the practice was not a self-indulgent amusement, but rather they were to remember the wonders of the past so that their lives would be open to an even greater wonders that God would do for them in the future. I often sing, you have heard me say it before, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. For us Christians, the same applies. Much, much has changed in the world and not for the better. But some truths according to God have not changed at all. And this we must believe and we must declare. For instance, the world needs Jesus. That hasn't changed. Men and women are still lost in the darkness of sins. That hasn't changed. Jesus is a wonderful savior. That hasn't changed. The blood of Christ can wash away every sin. That hasn't changed. God is faithful. That hasn't changed. His mercy endures forever. That also hasn't changed. We serve a risen Savior. That hasn't changed. In my Father's house are many mansions. That hasn't changed. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That hasn't changed. That God's word is true. That hasn't changed. That the Lord reigns. That hasn't changed. 
go into all the world and preach the gospel. That, my friends, hasn't changed either. And what about these words from Jesus? I am with you always. That hasn't changed. All things work together for good to those that love him. That hasn't changed and nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That hasn't changed. And guess what? Jesus is coming back again. You believe that? Doesn't matter whether you do or not. Because according to God's word, that hasn't changed either. He is coming. Nothing that matters has changed. The world out there, the unbelieving people out there cannot change these truths. The reality is God's truths abide forever and we will be judged by them. And so the world has changed, but the message of Christ in God's word remains the same. So let us reach out within our own hearts and minds and think about our own memorial stones, memorials to God's faithfulness to us. And so today, as we serve and live for God, let us remain faithful to him. And as the words of Peter are, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. May God help us to accept this his word and to be guided by it and live for his glory. Let us pray. Living God, we give you thanks and praise for your abundant grace. In days of old, you parted the waters with a mighty hand so that your people could cross safely and escape their pursuers. The waters not only parted in the Red Sea with Moses, but the Jordan with Joshua. We remember these mighty acts, and so in the same way, O oh God, grant safe passage to all of us who need you today. Passage through the torn of illness and grief and despair, passage through poverty and oppression, passage perhaps through toils and sneers of our own devising, where chaos swirls around us like mighty waters. Lead us by your Spirit. Forgive the times when we forget you. Forgive us, dear Lord, for not remembering the significance of our experiences of you in the past. O oh Lord, forgive us the times we do not trust you, when we demand miracles of our own timetable and of our own thinking. Give us the courage and faith to speak out for those in need. Give us the words also to witness to your life-changing gospel, not only to our children and grandchildren, but to everyone, to those who are thirsty, for those who need guidance, for those who need instructions, for those, Father, who need to hear the word of life. Help us to claim this new reality in our lives and for this world. O oh God of great love, we offer our gratitude for our family and our friends and for friends who are family. We are ever thankful for this church and our church family as we worship from wherever we are. We pray for the safekeeping of all who we love and we pray for your healing presence for all those who are ill, whom we name in our hearts. We pray for our nation and its, and its leaders. May they seek your wisdom and strength and may they lead us in the ways that make for peace. We pray for our world, especially do we pray for those who live where fighting is a way of life and where children carry guns instead of teddy bears. Let it be that all of us might be instruments of your peace and love. Oh Lord, help us. Help us, we pray, to be channels of your peace. And God of us all, let us answer words of anger with patience and let us respond to disagreements with compromise. Above all, let us speak the language of faith and truth, 
especially when we travel roads of uncertainty and fear. So Lord, be with your people. Grant us your peace. Give us your hope to dwell within us. And as we reflect on your word today, we offer our praise and our prayers to the one whose footsteps we strive to follow, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our loving Savior. Amen. And so our final hymn for this morning is 159, Lord for the Years. to him who is able to keep us from falling and lift us from the dark valley of despair to the mountains of hope, from the midnight of desperation to the daybreak of joy. To him be power and authority forever and ever. Go in peace, walk in confidence, follow God's leading, rely on on God's love and remember him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us now and always.